Hello, uh, Jeremy Rifkin is with me today. Uh, I'm Siva Vadianathan from the University of Virginia, and we're going to discuss his newest book, The Zero Marginal Cost Society. Uh, it's also his 20th book, which is quite a feat in and of itself. Um, uh, this book uh, takes the entire world as its subject, um, but has a tremendous amount of focus on the current state and mm -hmm. perhaps uh, immediate future state of the U.S. economy as well. Um, and so it, it ranges across so many topics. I'm sure we'll have a, a very rich set of discussions that will uh, link together quite nicely. So um, Jeremy, I was hoping you could uh, explain the title. That's a really good way to start. The Zero Marginal Cost Society. What, what do you mean by zero marginal cost? Well, let me put it in context. I think what's happening is we're just beginning to glimpse the outline of a new economic system entering onto the world stage, the collaborative commons. This is the first economic system to emerge since the advent of capitalism and socialism in the early 19th century. So it is a remarkable historic event with long-term implications for all of us around the world. The triggering agent for this great economic transformation is something called zero marginal cost. And let me explain. There's a paradox deeply embedded in the heart of the capitalist market, which has actually been responsible for the great success of the invisible hand over two centuries. The irony is this paradox is now leading to the ultimate triumph of capitalism, but that triumph is going to lead to its demise as the uh, primary economic system in the world. And here's the paradox. In a capitalist market, sellers are continually probing for new technologies that can increase their productivity, reduce their marginal costs so they can put out cheaper products, win over consumers and market share, and bring back some profits to their investors. Now, marginal costs are the cost of producing an additional unit of a good or service after your fixed costs are covered. Business people have always wanted to reduce marginal costs for obvious reasons. They simply never anticipated a technology revolution whose productivity was so extreme that it could actually reduce those marginal costs of producing and distributing goods and services to near zero, making uh, goods and services essentially or nearly free, abundant, and no longer subject to market forces. That's what's beginning to happen in a major way across the global economy. Uh, you know because of uh, your, what you teach, uh, because you spend a lot of time, and especially in media, we saw the zero marginal cost phenomena infect the information good industries over the last 10 years, devastating entire businesses. First, we saw Napster, and young people began to find ways to create software to share music files, bypassing the capitalist market and the recording industry, didn't pay any royalties and it brought the recording industry to its knees. Then the zero marginal cost phenomena started to infect the newspaper, magazine, and book publishing industry. Millions of consumers became prosumers, and they began to produce and share their own knowledge and information. Wikipedia, people shared knowledge together. News blogs, people shared news together. And then, of course, in publishing, people started putting out their own e-books free. And this meant that newspapers went out of business, magazines bellied up, the book publishing industry has been devastated by free ebooks. And uh, most recently, and of course, uh, you can speak to this uh, from the university point of view, massive open online courses. We now have six, seven million students that are taking these free online courses that operate at near zero marginal cost, taught by some of the best professors in the world, and they're receiving credit. This is now forcing the universities to rethink their business model. So in the last 10 years, this zero marginal cost phenomenon has not been academic. It has devastated entire information goods industry. But economists thought there would be a firewall here. They thought, OK, the zero marginal cost would affect information goods, but it would not move over from the virtual world to the physical world, the brick and mortar world of energy and manufactured products. And so that firewall wouldn't be breached. It's now being breached because the internet is now expanding to an internet of things, a more expansive internet that's now going to allow us to produce our own energy and, and products at near zero marginal cost. So the idea of the internet of things sounds in itself paradoxical to many people. Um, the internet to uh, our, our general way of thinking uh, is uh, about the flow of information, the flow of data, um, a distributed, non-controlled uh, flow of data that, that seems to uh, touch everybody in new and interesting ways every day and stretches the whole world. How would this apply to cars, to airplanes, to 
um, uh, uh, to collections of, uh, of everyday materials that you would buy in Walmart. The information internet, which we're all very familiar with, is just now beginning to converge with a nascent energy internet in Europe and now in China, and also beginning to converge with a fledgling automated transport and logistics internet. So the internet is expanding to three internets, the information internet, the energy internet, the automated transport and logistics internet. They're creating one super internet called the Internet of Things. And these three internets are then placing sensors across the entire economic system to monitor the flow of data. So we have sensors now uh, connecting uh, resource flows. We have sensors uh, feeding data in from production lines, warehouses, distribution centers. We have sensors on smart roads, sensors uh, that are connecting uh, the electricity grid so we know what the appliances are doing at any moment. We have sensors connecting vehicles and offices and stores. That big data coming in across the economy to these three internets, communication, energy internet, and logistics internet, is providing a wealth of data about what goes on at any given moment across the economy. And what this is, uh, we now have 14 billion sensors out there now, and uh, IBM says in 2020, 50 billion sensors, and by 2030, perhaps 100 trillion sensors connecting everything with everyone. And I know later on we'll talk about the questions of privacy and data security. So it's exhilarating and frightening at the same time. There's a lot of possibilities and a lot of challenges. But what's interesting from the opportunity perspective, millions of prosumers can now do with physical things what they did with information goods. They can go up on this expanded Internet of Things in the years ahead, and they can mine that big data coming through on their own mobiles with their own apps. And with that data coming through the system, they can uh, use analytics and create their own algorithms, just like Google and Facebook today, and dramatically increase their own productivity, reduce marginal cost in producing their own energy, their own 3D printed products, just like they now have reduced their marginal cost in information goods on the traditional internet. It's just beginning. It's only the first few years, but it's a tremendous shift in the economy. So uh, you've used the word prosumer. Could you explain what a prosumer is? And it was actually used by Alvin Toffler uh, many years, 25, 30 years ago. It's now really come into practice. Uh, that's consumers. When we say consumers become prosumers, prosumers produce, consume, and or share their own goods and services. Let me give you two examples of how this Internet of Things affects the physical world and turns all of us from consumers to prosumers. Renewable energy, 3D printed products. We now have millions and millions of early adopters in Europe who are actually producing their own green electricity with solar panels on the roof or wind turbines on their property, and they're producing it at near zero marginal cost. The technology for harvesting solar and wind and turning it into electricity is still a little pricey, but it's on an exponential curve. Just like we saw with computer chips uh, in the uh, computer industry, we've had a 20-year exponential curve with solar and wind. A solar watt costs $60 for one watt to produce in 1970. It's 66 cents a watt today, and it continues to go down. But even before the fixed costs are paid back for these harvesting technologies for solar and wind, the marginal cost of producing uh, a unit of sun, solar, electricity, or wind is near zero because the sun off your roof is free. You just have to capture it. The wind coming up the side of your building is free. You just have to capture it. So we have millions of people who are now producing their own green electricity at near zero marginal cost. They're sharing it with each other on the emerging energy internet in Europe. And to show you how fast this is moving, um, uh, China has taken up uh, uh, the, the plan that I've outlined in my last book, The Third Industrial Revolution, and now we're working on the new book. And uh, I visited the Chinese leadership last year. And after my visit, they announced an $80 billion four-year commitment, $80 billion in four years, to begin to lay out the energy internet of this internet of things so millions of Chinese people can produce their own a solar and wind electricity and distribute it across China. By contrast, the U.S. is putting up $3.5 billion for its energy internet, which is centralized, not distributed, over a 20-year period. So Europe and China are quite far ahead on this. So if people are making their own stuff, making their own expressions, and making their own energy, apparently. Um, uh, uh, how are they able to find um, markets? How are they able to find...